Hey, it's great to see you again, Rex. It's nice to see you, Judith. Good. I know that you're always doing so many things. Every time we don't see each other for a while and then we come back together, I get flooded with all these new great things that you're doing in your research. J just give me a little bit of background about what's going on in, your, in the research area for you right now. Well, we're still studying creativity uh, a, f a few years later, but I think we're making some uh, real advances. We're starting to learn some of the critical nodes and networks in the brain that uh, appear to be involved in creativity, which mm -hmm. I think is pretty exciting. We were really uh, kind of fumbling around in the dark when I first started, met you uh, several mm -hmm. years ago. And now I think we're really starting, and, and with others uh, around the world, this kind of uh, network of uh, individual groups that are doing research uh, mm -hmm. in creativity are starting to make progress and starting to really see how it works in the brain. So I want to talk a little bit, use the word networks, and that wasn't necessarily a word a couple years ago that people were bannering around. It was like, which part of the brain? Right. Right. But give us, give me and everybody who's listening uh, a little bit of a grounding around what this new concept of networks and creativity is all about. Yeah, when you see stories in the Wall Street Journal or New York Times or any magazine, you used to see these bits of brain that lit up when someone uh, did a certain task or performed in a certain way. And now we're getting an in increased appreciation that these bits of brain are lots of bits of brain that are working in a concerted way in a network and that these networks are shifting back and forth uh, in the brain as people are shifting their attention, shifting their working memory, shifting their reasoning ability, shifting their creativity mm -hmm. in, in different ways uh, towards uh, environmental demand. So these networks are, are really uh, modulating the, the activity of the brain over time. And I think that's a really kind of a paradigm shift in the neuroscientist rather than bits of brain that we can talk about. We're really starting to look at the networks and how the connectivity and the organization of these networks are, are, are arranged over uh, individuals and, and groups of individuals. Yeah. So I love what you just said because what you're saying is that the brain is a connective being. It's, it's part of us that connects a lot. It really and is, yeah. So, and, and when it's when it's in a network, are you talking about electrical networks? Are you talking about chemical? Are you talking about a combination of both? Like yeah, that? yeah. So, so the, the the brain is a bi uh, an electrochemical machine, if you will. So it's both electrical networks that are organized through the white matter of the brain, which are these wires, like the wires that connect your your computer to the internet. So mm -hmm. your computer is powerful, and um, it has lots of uh, abilities on your on your desktop or in, in your laptop. But when you connect through the wires to the internet, your computer to other computers, it really magnifies the power of your computer to pull information in from other computers. Mm -hmm. That's the white matter of the brain, the wires that connect different nodes uh, of this network mm -hmm. to each other to mm -hmm. do uh, computational things. Yeah. So, so we have all this stuff going on in the brain, it's electrical, it's chemical, and so yeah. forth. So I, I, I know that people want to understand um, how do we create an environment where people can be more creative? Because there was this old thinking that some people have it, some people don't. I don't think you really believe that. You've done so much work on creativity that I want people to hear about a different point of view. Gosh, I think everyone has creative capacity. And, and if this creative thing exists, it should exist in all humans. It's probably a bell-shaped curve. So, I mean, it probably, you know, there's the middle where most of us reside. Mm -hmm. um, you may be at the far <laughs> end of extreme, uh, but most of us reside in this kind of middle of, of average or above average, and there's some people who are lower and higher. Um, but everyone has some creativity, and, and you can uh, increase or decrease that depending on your in, engagement with the environment or engagement with other individuals. Right. So I want you to help us understand what turns off creativity and what lights it up, and what does that have to do with conversations? In other words, are there certain types of things as we're interacting with people that we're actually taking away somebody's, like, uh, you know, uh, absorbing somebody's creativity by what we're doing, and we may not even know it. Help me and everybody understand It's that really a bit. complicated. Um, so I go back to the definition of creativity, which is the production of something novel and useful. Mm -hmm. And some people add surprising uh, to that as well. So, um, and, and when people are working in groups, um, there's this tension. So you, you want to get along. You and I are having a great conversation, and we're being very sociable, mm -hmm. and we're being uh, nice uh, to each other in our conversation. And but I if, want you to like me. And, and right? we want we want to yeah, like each other. Right. Yes. Yeah. But but sometimes when you're creating something new, um, those those niceties need to be kind of set aside because if you spend too much time trying to 
go along to get along, you're not really going to create that really great new thing. Mm -hmm. So there's this dynamic tension between getting along with others and then going that extra step to create something novel and useful. Because by the way, the world doesn't want to hear all your great new ideas. They like the way things have been yeah. uh, heretofore. So you, you really are, are you know, tilting against windmills or pushing the paradigm and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So it is kind of disagreeable behavior to do that creativity thing mm -hmm. in, in a certain extent. And you don't want to be too disagreeable mm -hmm. because people will just push you away. Right. But you have to approach it in a way that you can engage them that, hey, this, this could be a very useful thing. It's not only novel, but it's also useful. Right. And it, it's surprising, but that doesn't have to be scary. Yeah. So what we're beginning to see more and more of in conversational intelligence is there is a difference between people that can engage others creatively and those that can't. So for example, the push away response that we get from people is when somebody tells their idea, which they've been stirring up and waiting to tell the boss, and the boss yep. says, what, are you kidding? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. What chemical chemistry goes on in the brain when somebody feels that push away, that horrible rejection? <laughs> Lots of bad chemistry, I'm sure. I mean, I don't understand the biochemical mechanisms as well as some, but uh, you know, there's. Um, I, I know there's um, like uh, the cortisols and things like that. Yeah, that's there's been lots of research that's been done with cortisol and oxytocin, mm -hmm. for example. These two main chemicals. It's much more complex than that. But ox uh, cortisol is one. You know, a stress hormone that people have been studying, for example. And you can mm -hmm. measure it in the blood. You can measure it in the saliva. You can measure it uh, all different places. But uh, the, the, it it can be adaptive to be stressed and to be wary of environmental threats. Mm -hmm. That's an adaptive feature of the brain. And in fact, um, you know, all of the anxiety that we feel as humans has made us uh, massively successful as a species yeah. um, because we've stayed out of trouble and stayed alive. And can avoid the lion. And right? can avoid the lion and can avoid these threats. Yeah. So it's very adaptive and, and we, we, we sometimes overdo it yeah. in terms of this threat assessment. And, and our brains are really really adept at evaluating threats and throwing off these chemicals, cortisol and others, yeah. uh, that are designed to, uh, to really keep us out of trouble. Yeah. And in these social interactions that you're talking about, where people are talking about things that are foreign, novel, uh, and surprising, mm -hmm. um, it can be mistaken for a threat. Yeah. And, and we have to be careful when we're, we're in that environment that uh, it, it is uh, people that are in a uh, trusting uh, environment so that you can push it that extra step and it's yeah. not just rejected immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So you were just talking about, and we were talking about the external environment of other human beings that impact us. Mm -hmm. y you shared with me um, an idea that I think everybody needs to hear about, which is what goes on in our internal environment. There's an internal and an external. And to really maximize people's creativity, even those that think they don't have it, what you describe is a way to release creativity, even if you're not sure you have it. It does something to the brain that enables you to be more effective and creative. Tell, tell us what that is. It does. And it, we're really learning that this kind of downtime where people are kind of um, thinking about their own thoughts. Uh, in neuroscience, this is kind of the hot new topic. It's called the default mode network of mm -hmm. the brain. And uh, it's kind of the, mir the, the new mirror neurons. So the right. mirror no neurons are really hot, and they still are. Yeah. But the default mode network is very hot. It's like, what's going on when the brain is just kind of idling? Yeah. And people are thinking about their relationships, and people are thinking about their grocery lists, and people are thinking about what they want to do next week. It's the brain kind of pinging this network, uh, this internal network, where they're not solving problems out in the environment, but they're solving internal problems. And they're doing simulations, and they're doing visualizations of how they might um, interact with someone in the future mm -hmm. and how they might solve a problem in the future. And they can do these simulations without wasting a lot of energy. It's a very efficient process. Mm -hmm. uh, the brain is an expensive organ to run and to be able to do simulations, mental simulations, is such an efficient thing to be able to say, that's not going to work. If I, if I talk to this person this way, that might approach it slightly better. Yeah. Nah, that's not going to work either. If I'd said this, that's going to crack it. Right. And to be able to do that visualization, those, uh, you know, Einstein talked about his, his thought experiments. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are doing this all the time and that downtime is necessary for people to do these mental simulations, this mm -hmm. default mode network, this yeah. internal thought process. It's default, but it's not devoid of no. intelligence. In fact, Absolutely it gives not. you a chance to see the world in front of you, your very eyes before it's there, right. and to practice. Yep. I 
call that developing, or we call it in conversational intelligence, developing the third eye. Yeah. Where you really, because you gain wisdom from looking at what this choice or that choice or this choice is going to have as an impact. Before you just blunder Before you into blunder it. Blunder into it, right. exactly, right. And, um, and, and you can find in that, in that kind of percolating uh, of ideas, you can find an idea that emerges from that cauldron mm -hmm. and select it and say, this is what I'm going to push forward. Yeah. Then you go into the external world, and this is kind of more the, uh, it's called the cognitive control network, the attentional uh, network, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, where you can push an idea out into the external world. You can say, this is what I'm going to do. You act on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that happens, you're, you're, you're cogitating on it. You're thinking about it. You're, mm -hmm. you're simulating it. Mm -hmm. And this back and forth between the default mode network and the cognitive control network, and it's modulated, interestingly, by the salience network. The salience is, you know, what is, what is important? What is salient? Literally, what is uh, what is relevant, relevant. Yeah. Uh, to to what's going on now, mm -hmm. and you can flip this back and forth with the salience uh, of the situation, the salience of your emotions, mm -hmm. the salience of your uh, needs in the environment, yeah. uh, and flipping these networks back and forth is a very powerful thing that we're seeing in creativity research and cognitive neuroscience in general. So, what releases the most creative? Impulses in people. <laughs> I saw, if I knew that, <laughs> <laughs> we pack it in and sell we it. Right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think we're getting closer, though. I, yeah. I think. Um, um, what I'm telling people when I give talks is that this downtime is really important. Mm -hmm. That uh, you know, to be creative, you need uh, preparation, incubation, illumination, verification. These are the four basic steps. That preparation, you need the raw materials to be creative with. Mm -hmm. You have to put some stuff in your brain to percolate around. Mm -hmm. That incubation is that downtime, that default mode network stuff that you have to be able to cogitate, to percolate, to think about, to simulate, mm -hmm. and and people lose lose track of that and that is the thing that I'm really pushing in my talks that all this attention to our iPhones and the computer and the internet and uh, all the different things that we're, we're still acquiring information as opposed to just thinking about information. Right. We're really losing that capability and I think we need to revisit that. Yeah. Uh, that the, the long walk in the woods, the meditation, the uh, warm bath, uh, these different things and, and highly creative people have those tools, those tricks if mm -hmm. you will, uh, that allow them to enter that state. Yeah. So we talk about level three conversations which is that state where you're in your non-judgmental you're um, appreciating the other person, you're really communicating, you're listening without judgment. You're setting a stage, a conversational stage where that energy that's around two people feels good to the other person. Yeah. And I, I know it sounds a little bit woo-woo sometimes, you know I, I do that, but, yeah. but in a way, isn't it in a, in a way creating a space where people's brains are free of that judgment, that you need something to enable those new ideas that we often screen out, to not be screened out. You know, or what are some of those conditions? And, and it is, um, it's, it's important in that conversation that you're talking about in the external world, it's, a, it's, it's also important in the internal world when mm -hmm. people are doing that, that, that cogitating, that incubation um, to not down select too early. Um, so that they can run with an idea, even if it's kind of a crazy idea, for a mm -hmm. while to see how uh, long they can run with it. Yeah. Um, if you down select too early, then you're not going to get that novel, useful, and surprising idea. Right. Down select it, means judging in yeah. a way. It's, yeah. it's saying no, that's, oh, that's yeah. going to be crazy or that's silly or definitely you know, judging. We could never do anything like yeah, that. Definitely right? judging too early, and you see that. So the external world is actually a metaphor for this internal world that I'm talking about, as opposed to vice versa. Where uh, in, in a conversation, you can be too judgmental and too. Um, rigid in your thought process and and nothing new will happen mm -hmm. in the internal world that is a metaphor for the internal yeah. world where you just have to let the ideas just kind of sit for a while yep. and uh, to get back to your original question um, to, to, to let that happen you have to exercise it mm -hmm. um, uh, it's you know, I'm a clinical psychologist by training so we do cognitive behavioral therapy so thoughts lead to actions and mm -hmm. uh, that thought it's like oh that's silly that's not gonna work it's like wait a second, you have to back up and say, why is that silly? That's not so silly. Yeah. And, That's, how, can and, and, and how can we make it work? Yeah. Right, because thoughts do lead to actions right. or, or inaction or mm -hmm. inactivity. So yep. uh, dealing with that thought that precedes the action is very important. And if people can train that muscle in their brain to not uh, immediately accept that thought or to evaluate that thought uh, a little more closely, I think yep. that's very important. Yep. And to be a little more... Um, 
present with uh, their thoughts and with their interactions on the external world with other people. That yeah. it's, uh, uh, I think, helpful in that in that creative process. Right. So I want to test out a couple things with you, which is that um, this word co-creation has become probably the biggest thing in my practice area and conversational intelligence because it suggests that we're not collaborating with people. Collaboration means cohorting with the enemy, actually. That's yeah. the definition, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Which already gives you, you know, a faux right. friend <laughs> right. setup that's that They might steal the idea that's from right. me. Exactly. Yeah. And then you, you're not transparent, you're not sharing all the things that our brain likes to see. Yeah. So what are what are some things that are going on when two people are really co-creating in a healthy way where the brain is is opening up, you know, are there certain little things that people, if we could put a magnifying lens on without getting too clinical, but just that people need to know, because I know we, we know things about oxytocin, that there's a bonding that goes on when people are all of a sudden feel that, th that they can speak that part of their mind. Sure. Are there other things that, that are happening that, that inspire people and can inspire, inspire them to be more co-creative? I haven't done research in that area. I think we're getting closer. They're doing, um, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but they're doing a, a functional imaging process where they're putting two people in a scanner and they're interacting with each other in real mm -hmm. time. There's a real cool uh, study that was done uh, with Charles Lim, mm -hmm. uh, where he's uh, doing improvisational uh, music outside of the scanner, and someone's in the scanner, mm -hmm. and they're riffing off what he's doing outside of the scanner. Mm -hmm. and, and you're actually seeing uh, this process play out in the brain, where they're shutting off the critic of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and this default mode network comes alive. Mm -hmm. And you can see this improvisational ability in, in these uh, pianists um, really bloom. Mm -hmm. and and I think that's what we're going for mm -hmm. uh, when you see two people interacting with each other. And we saw this, and uh, they have a rap study as well, which is really funny, rappers doing uh, improvisational rap in the scanner. Yeah. And you see uh, this down-regulation of the critical parts of the brain, the part that keeps you out of trouble in the, door, uh, in the external world, and the blooming or the uh, uh, rising of uh, the default mode network. Right. I think... Um, in terms of mechanisms for doing that in the external world, you know, we need again to practice that. We need to uh, work with other people in a meaningful way. That's where you're. That's where you come in yeah. with your tools and techniques that yeah. I think are very useful yeah. in getting people to communicate more effectively, to 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 build that trust before they can push to that next level. Yeah. I think that's really important uh, tool. But then to have people go back and build that muscle on their own, so they know how to uh, dampen that critic within. Yeah. So part of what we talk about is priming, that you prime the brain before you're going to do creative things and really work where you're going to take risks and maybe speak ridiculous things, that you yeah. literally prime each other like you would uh, go to the bar and have a drink. Right. There's a cocktail of oxytocin that you begin to, you know, really check out that other person and look in their eyes and, right. you know, support them and be excited that they're there and all those things and yeah. let them know it's okay to say whatever's on their mind. Right. And all of a sudden, the chemistry does change, doesn't it? I mean, I'm not, we're not making this stuff up now. This is real hard science. It yeah. is, and having a conversation before you have a conversation, there's good psych psychological cognitive science behind that, that it, you don't, you don't, you're not just gonna jump, in a con jump into a creative process without getting to know each other first mm -hmm. and, and having that trust build over time. Mm -hmm. I just heard a talk from uh, the president of uh, Pixar, Disney, uh, where he was talking about this, uh, this group collaborative process and it was uh, really interesting to listen to him uh, that you know there wasn't this top-down process. You didn't mm -hmm. have a boss who could veto any idea. Um, there's lots of ideas, uh, and, and it had been like that at Disney. And I guess that you know created a lot of uh, creative problems and, mm -hmm. and lack of success. Yeah. Now they're having organized uh, meetings where they can argue with each other, bandy, bandy about ideas. And he told the story of uh, Up. And up was this uh, ridiculous story of a king who was in a castle and you know uh, flew up in the air, and that's how it started out. And you know the story of up with this old man and his wife died, and uh, he had a, a cast a, a, a person who a young boy who was in the house with him. Completely different story. That came about <laughs> through a long process. The only part of the original storyboard was some weird bird that they came across. But through this creative cauldron that they had, uh, that they were able to uh, go through these ideas and that's not going to work and trust each other, uh, they were able to build this beautiful, beautiful story over time. And they didn't know the destination. Yep. They just knew that they trusted each other enough to get to that destination.
collaboration. So I think that's a big piece about um, creating a co-creating relationship and about creativity when they come hand in hand, that we don't always know where the end game is. We have to free ourselves off of being that tough executive that says, know exactly where we're going and we're going to get there. And, and it's going to cost else. this much. And it's going to cost, right, exactly, because yeah. that's a different part of our brain that's starting to mathematically calculate the success through quantitative things. But is to create that space where you can be have fun again, like you were with a kid, experiment with new ideas, entertain the impossible in all sorts of weird ways. And then that frees people to actually go there. I mean, their brains actually get instructed to, it's okay. Think crazy, think wild. And they really have to believe that. I mean, he, he talked also about feeding the beast. I mean, there's there's a beast of Hollywood that you have to feed the, the people that are working, the people behind the cameras, the people that are doing the hard work of making these movies. Um, so there is a bottom line at the end of the day that you're you're working towards, and there are deadlines that you're working towards. But the people that were doing this creative thing were were freed enough from that process that they were able to do um, some very surprising and novel things. Right. So if I were to give you a million dollars and say that you could spend it on <laughs> 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 any of your newest thinking about what helps human beings elevate their skills to think more creatively, more co-creatively. Are there certain things that if you had the money and the equipment to do it that you'd want to start to explore because you've said, wow, this is curious and I wish we could figure this one out. Is there anything that's, that's, that would be in your laboratory happening today if, if I wrote you that check? So I'm actually going after another grant for about a million dollars to study uh, genius, which is a real highfalutin thing. And there is this notion that genius is just high intelligence mm -hmm. or genius is just high talent. Mm -hmm. um, and I think intelligence are, is probably involved. It's a type of reasoning that allows you to acquire information, do things rapidly and accurately. Talent is certainly involved, but it's, it's not just that. It's part of the definition of genius. And you and I and most people also experience what we call near genius, mm -hmm. where we go, God, that was a really great idea I had. I wish I could do that every day. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. the geniuses they, they can that do right. that every yeah. day. Yeah. And if we can harness that, that ability that, again, we all have, and it has something very critically to do with creativity. Mm -hmm. And um, so intelligence is involved, talent is involved, creativity is critically involved. Mm -hmm. And it's this upregulation or this fidelity of certain parts of the brain that are intact and functioning and able to acquire and implement information and reasoning, deductive reasoning mm -hmm. in rapid and accurate ways. But it's also this downregulation ability, uh, probably in the frontal lobes, uh, that allows you to wait and cogitate and simulate and process. And the fact of the high fidelity, low fidelity uh, occurring in a individual brain uh, the fa the, the, having both of these occur in the individual brain uh, ensures that it's going to be rare. That's why genius is so rare. Right. So we have to understand that, and I think that's what I'm going to study next. I hope you do, and I, I want to stay in touch with you during the process of doing this because part of what I believe in conversational intelligence is that as we teach leaders to be more in what I call the agility mindset, where we can downregulate and upregulate, learn how to use the parts of our brain, those mechanisms that we're hardwired to use, yeah. that it's going to produce more genius people. That's why conversational intelligence, we use the word intelligence because it's my belief, this is my fantasy about yeah. it. So I want to invest in, and I'm investing heart and soul in what you're doing. Yeah. Because I think that we could then translate what you're doing and saying, how do we bring that into classrooms early? Right. How do we teach kids, right? And I think we can get more of this in the near genius that we have. I mean, right. this is a world that just begs for innovation. <laughs> That's right. And, and we're going to really critically need it, I think, moving forward. It's an increasingly complex yeah. world. And so having at least the capacity to tap into this more often for, for us poor near geniuses <laughs> right, that, exactly. that experience this every once in a great while, yeah. I think is really critical. And to be able to cultivate this in the young mind is exceedingly critical and exciting and, and exciting. imagine imagine you know 10 or 20 years from now the kids are going to be taught to do this that's part of the muscle that's being built not I just that so. I can remember right. and memorize right right and and I think we're you know when I talk to educators I think we're doing that wrong you need the raw materials in your brain to do that and I think we're overshooting in that direction we've got all the raw I materials in there agree more. but one of the most important classes for me when I was going to school was recess because <laughs> you, you go out and you skin your knee and you try out ideas and you have downtime to yeah. to play but yeah. you know three hours of homework uh, at night even after you go home I don't know if that's if, if that's the right direction I think there needs to be time to imagine that you're an archaeologist and go digging out in your backyard yes 
And well, I actually went ahead and became an archaeologist before I became uh, uh, what I'm doing now. I'm yeah. an organizational anthropologist now. Right. right? Yeah. So, but it's all about digging and how do we teach the digging around, the thinking, the, the not ignoring things that aren't in front of us yet, but right. to kind of play with that part of our mind. And it's you have great. to have the raw materials, but you also have to know what you're going to do with those yeah. raw materials. And you yeah. have to have the downtime to be able to put them together yeah. in surprising ways. Okay. Well, I love everything you're saying. I'm thrilled to have the chance to see you again and to talk about what gets your eyes lit up. They sparkle when you talk about this. Yep, I'm very excited about it. Terrific. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Great.